Room in your heart. That's uh, where the joy begins. I was an eight-year-old boy when I was at a camp and around a campfire, the camp leader led me in a prayer to ask the Lord Jesus to come into my heart. And that's when the joy began. That's when the joy began. And we're on Advent joy. Advent joy, I know what you're thinking, well, what is this thing called joy? What is joy? So I went to the dictionary, and the dictionary online gave me this. A feeling of great pleasure and happiness. I want you to notice in that last word, happiness is the word happen. You see, the dictionary term for joy is if everything goes the way I want it to go, it just happens to go my way, I'm happy. But if things don't go the way I want them to go, I am sad or angry, right? <laughs> angry, because it's just not going my way, all right? And I, I, I say, now that's not the, the Bible concept at all. In fact, the Bible has a much different emphasis. The biblical meaning seems to be this. It's a great satisfaction from being in the will of God no matter what the circumstances are that are surrounding you. Now that's joy. Happiness depends on what happens. Joy does not depend on what happens. For example, the Apostle Paul gets incarcerated. Someone said the first thing the Apostle Paul did in every town he visited was check in at the jailer because he knew sooner or later he'd be there. And so he finds himself incarcerated in Philippi, and, uh, and uh, he's incarcerated, and uh, he's singing songs and praise unto God. I don't think many of us would be doing that. We'd be saying, woe is me. Look at the mess I got myself into because I follow Jesus. And here he is, he's singing praise. And, 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 and you know what happens? There's a earthquake, the doors are sprung open, and, the, and it seems like all the prisoners are fleeing, and, and the Philippian jailer is about to thrust himself on a sword because he's responsible, his life, for any escaped prisoner life. He says, hey, don't do yourself any wrong. Don't do any harm. We're all here. He came out and told him about Jesus. He accepted Jesus, was baptized that very night, and he told his family, the whole family got saved, and there was joy. You see, because he had joy in the circumstances, even when the circumstances weren't pleasant. So he writes the book of Philippians, and he's writing back to the Philippians when he's away, and in the book of Philippians, he keeps telling them, rejoice, rejoice. And there's one place in the book, he says, Re rejoice in the Lord, again I say rejoice. If that isn't like, it's in your face, you need to have joy. And he wrote that while he was in prison. It does not depend on the circumstances. So that's why I want to come around. God's joy, his advent joy, is for us. God's joy is for me. And that makes it a little more personal. Say that to yourself. God's joy is for me. It's for me. See, this is what happened. It was already read, you know, okay? Uh, Gabriel did a better reading than I will do. But it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around those shepherds, and they were terrified, and the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I think this is the first line that comes out of every angel's mouth. Don't be afraid. They are masculine, they're strong, they're fearsome, and when people see them, they shake and they quake. And he says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news, here it is, of great joy, great joy. Not happiness, great joy that will be for all people. The ability to find meaning and have an elation, be satisfied, find purpose, no matter what the circumstance, is now available to everyone. It's here for the taking. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is the one who, he's telling this, the shepherds, there's this baby wrapped up in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger in Bethlehem, and he is the one that's going to bring great joy that will be for all people. He says, today, 
in the town of David is a Savior that has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. A Savior. A Savior saves. That's what makes the Savior a Savior. I probably told a story before. Years ago, we were in a state park in Indiana. My kids were small, and we're at the pool, and we're watching. I'm watching them as they dive in, and they swim to the shore, get out. And I'm curious because there's three little girls about the same ages as my three little boys, and they're dominating the, the diving board. And by dominating, I mean they go up to the edge, and they stop, and turn around. The other one will go, go, you can do it, you can do it. She'd go up to the edge, stop. Then she'd turn around and then get the other girl saying, you can do it, you can do it. Finally, my curiosity is piqued. Is this girl going to do it or not? She jumps in. She didn't die. She jumps in. I'm watching, okay, and uh, watching the other one. And I look and a little hand slips up out of the water, goes back down. I said, oh no, we got a problem here. Happens again, that little hand goes up, slips right back down. Oh my goodness, this girl can't swim. So I jumped out of my lounge chair, da 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 da, and I jump into the water. Shh, the adrenaline is rushing through my body. That little hand came up one more time. I grabbed it and gave it a jerk. This little girl literally went flying over my head. <laughs> over to, it's amazing what that adrenaline rush will do to you. So then I'm pushing her up against the, 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 the side of the, the pool there, and I push her up out, and by this time, the lifeguard who had dove in is swimming over, and then she's a day late and a dollar short. I already got the little girl out. She's doing fine. Guess who was the savior? I was the savior. <laughs> the lifeguard was not the savior because the lifeguard didn't rescue didn't save. She was trained. I wasn't. I just read the little sign on the inside to throw a life ring, and there was a long pole or used a pole, but I forgot all of that, and I just jumped in, grabbed that little hand, and whoo, there she went. <laughs> After that, my kids were saying, my dad's a hero, my dad's a hero. I said, knock it off, you guys. Oh, then they did it all the more. <laughs> a savior saves. God sent the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That's why we have joy. No matter how bad, whatever the circumstances may be, I just connect with my Savior, and He rescues me. Isn't that great? That's great. great. Joy to all peoples, for all people. Now, God's joy is not only for us, but it is over us. God has joy over us. Listen, Jesus tells the story. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And then it goes on and says, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. After he tells the parable, he adds these words. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. You see, Heaven rejoices over you. Heaven rejoices over me. Oh, can you see all the angels? Man, the mo that moment when I, I prayed that little simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I, I, I can just see it now. The whole harp section. They're playing the harps. Uh, all those blonde angels are singing, and then they're over here, you know, got the redheads playing their trumpets. And, and, and they're... There's this big party going on. Why? There's joy in heaven that I turned from myself and the world and my sin and turned to Jesus and accepted Jesus as my Savior. Man. Now, 
He goes on, I'm skipping over, he tells a parable about uh, the lady had 10 coins, lost one, and then she sweeps the house, she can't find it. Finally, she finds it, and she rejoices, calls her friends in and all of that. And he says, and she's just rejoicing because the lost coin was found. And then it says, in the same way, I tell you, there'll be rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. I think that's so important. The other verse said there's going to be rejoicing in heaven. All the angels are singing and praising and going on because oh, I accepted Jesus. This verse says, oh, in the presence of all those angels. Now, who's in the presence of all those angels? God. You see what this verse is saying? God is rejoicing over one sinner who repents and comes to him. God has joy over me. Isn't that great? I love that verse. God has joy over me. Over me. I love that verse. So there's joy for us, over us, and there is God's joy in us. In us. All right? Of course, that's me up there. I chopped my head off. And if I were to pull my shirt apart, it, you wouldn't really see the joy there, but the joy is in my heart. Remember that song? I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. It's way down in my heart. Okay. Jesus says this in John 15. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. The joy of Jesus Christ is inside me. Now, in a moment, we're going to look at the joy of Jesus. But right now, just take it. Jesus' joy is inside me so that my joy, your joy, may be complete. He's going to cap it all off. You're going to have this wonderful, great joy. And this is the Advent joy. It's inside me. Now, listen, we look at another verse in 1 Peter. It says this. Though you have not seen him, I've never seen Jesus. He's in heaven, I'm here on earth. You love him, yes, I love Jesus. And even though you do not see him now, you believe, yes, I believe in him. And I am filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. It is in there. It's in there. It's in there. So Philippians gives us this command. It's a command. All right, this is a command. There's a lot of commands in the Bible that aren't the Ten Commandments. This is a command. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. That's what Paul was doing when he was in jail. He'd been incarcerated. His legs are in stocks. And they're singing. They're just singing away. And the jailer's saying, these guys are crazy. They got the joy of the Lord, the joy, no matter what the circumstance. And always, always they're, they're rejoicing. He says, and, and I will say again, rejoice. He says, I just can't tell you much. You got to rejoice. Rejoice. You see, because it's in there. Jesus put it in you. But we have got to work it out. The moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Ooh, I knew it. I knew it. Man, that was so exciting, so exhilarating. Next day I went to the camp bookstore and I bought a New Testament and I bought a postcard and I wrote my mom home to tell her I had just gotten staved. I misspelled it. <laughs> Third grader, what, what can you say? I'm a little dyslexic. I still misspell words, but that one I got down, saved. I was saved. I had the joy in my heart and it was expressing itself to writing home to tell my mom my mom saved that postcard. I got it to this very day. Greatest treasure I have. Listen, joy, God's joy is before us. It's set before us. Listen to this. Remember I said that we have the Jesus' joy in us? Listen, here's, here's Jesus' joy. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. We're running a race, okay? In the Bible verse before this says, you're running the Christian race. You throw off everything that's the weighing you down, weighing you down. You never see, you never see a runner in a marathon with snowshoes on. They got to go. They don't have an overcoat on. Ah, it's got to go. Everything that's a weight. In fact, some of them are a little bit too skimpy. I was afraid that if they did that through the desert, they'd get sunburned for sure, right? But they're stripping down everything because they don't want to this weight. It's just, 
throwing off every weight that so easily besets us because I've got my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm running a race. He is the author and finisher or perfecter, the completer of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he was running for a prize, the joy. What's the joy of Jesus? Well, he endured the cross. What's the joy? When he sees me except Jesus as my Savior. All the angels are rejoicing. God is rejoicing. Jesus is rejoicing. Are you getting this? The Bible's full of joy. It's, it's a joyful book. The joy set before him, you see, it's not about the circumstances because the following word says, he endured the cross to get the joy. The cross before the crown. Pain before the gain. You know how this works. It's delayed gratification. We're in a generation now, we're in a selfie generation. I want it and I want it. I want it. I want it and I want it now. And God says, you have to be patient. There's joy. It's ahead of you. It's set before you. You're going to, like Jesus, endure some things through life that aren't pleasant, but at the end you're going to have great joy. And Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. Listen. You know the story about <clears throat> the man had three servants, and to the one servant he gave five talents, to another one he gave two talents, to the one he gave one talent, and uh, they all did something with their talent. And when the master came back after his long journey, he comes and he said, okay, let me see what you got. And, and uh, the man that had the five talents, and I got five gold pieces up there for the talents, he says, Look, oh, oh, I put it out into, into investments, and this is what's come back. I've not only got five, I got another five. And then the Lord says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. What happens, he says next? Enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to suggest to you, you will have more joy and more joy and more joy the more you worship and serve Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And if you don't, you have less and less. This guy had five, got five. He said, listen, I, I've taken what you've given me, Lord, and, and I've invested it and I, I've multiplied it and here it is. Here it is. I'm giving it all back to you. And he says, now enter into the joy. You're going to have such a joyful experience. The other man got two coins. And you know what happened. He went out and he invested them. He came back and the master says to him, hey, what have you done? He says, hey, Lord. He says, I I've got two the and there's these two more that I've accumulated. And the Lord says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. What's the answer? Enter into the joy. There's a coming joy. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a coming joy. There's joy now, but there is joy yet to come. This is amazing. You know, the other guy he got one coin and uh, the one talent. And the guy said, well, I knew that you're a kind of guy, Lord, that you get, you, you get investments from where you haven't even sown, man. You're just, he said, and I was afraid I'd lose it. And so this is what I did. I went out and I buried your coin. And he didn't do anything with what the Lord gave him. And so when the Lord came back, he went out and he dug it back up and he said, hey, here's your one coin. You wicked and lazy servant. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. When you waste your coin, your talent, your life, you lose your joy. Wow. You lose your joy. You lose your joy. The book of Isaiah says that this joy is in a coming kingdom. There, he said they will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. You see, there is joy before us. That's where we're heading. We're heading to a time of glory of the Lord and great joy. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is so important. He says it a second time in Isaiah. The ransom of the Lord, those who have been redeemed by the Lord, will return and they will enter Zion singing. 
everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Not only do we get joy now, we get eternal joy with Jesus Christ our Lord. Now joy is losable. It is losable. You can lose it. If it's not contingent on circumstances, okay, if, if it, no matter what the circumstance, if circumstance can't take it away, if, if you have joy and bad things are happening, like you get incarcerated or you get sick or you have financial collapse and disaster, if none of that can take it away, how do you lose your joy? Well, I want to share with you how you lose it. You lose it when you leave the will of God, whatever the will of God may be for your life. When, when you don't use what God has given you for the Lord and you keep it to yourself or whenever you, you step out of God's will and say, I'm going to do my own thing. Do you think for a moment that Jonah was really happy inside the belly of a whale? I know it says great fish. And then that fish was spoken to by God and he spit him out. Do you realize what a mess he was? Where's the joy in that? When you're out of the will of God, you lose your joy. King David found that out. The circumstance, I want to talk about the circumstances. A King David, when it was the time that kings were supposed to go out to war, says that in the very first verse of the, uh, Samuel where the record is, it says, uh, when it was time when they should go out to war, he didn't go with them. Kings led their armies in the battle, and he did not go. He just sent his generals out. And so he's up on his rooftop and he's gazing down and you know what's going on in this story. He lost his joy. So much so that in Psalm 51, he writes later, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Notice he doesn't say restore the salvation. He knew he was saved. God saved him. He didn't lose his salvation. But the joy of being saved was lost. It was lost. So here's my diagram. He had the joy. You see, if you say restore, he had to have it first. He, he already had the joy, and then he lost his joy. And in this verse, he's praying, God, give me back the joy. Restore the joy. <clears throat> I think all of us, when we act like David and we step outside the will of God, we lose our joy. And in order to get back the joy, we got to step back back into the will of God. It's just that simple. Watch. I want to focus on how he lost his joy. He was tempted. The kings, had, the, the kings were supposed to go out to battle. He didn't go. He was up on his rooftop overlooking his neighbor and there Uriah's wife Bathsheba was out bathing. Now, she wasn't bathing in a swimming suit, even though, I tell you, they call them bathing suits. All right. And so he looks down and he's tempted he sees that she's beautiful, he's full of lust and covetousness, the temptation. When he caves to it, you see, that's the next thing, he yields to it, he summons her to come to his house. He's the king. She has to go. So she goes and he sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. She sends back a message to him. This is some time later, she's now pregnant. And she says, I'm pregnant. Basically, what are you going to do about it, king? Well, here's what the king's going to do about it. He's going to cover it up. He stepped out of God's will. Instead of saying, oh, Lord, I need to get back in will God's will, he said, I'm just going to cover this whole mess up. Maybe even God won't even notice. You, you think we don't act like that? We lie and say a lie, and we step out of what God wants us to do. We've lied. And then somebody else asks about it. Now, I, what do I do? I tell another lie. And then somebody else says, well, I heard about that. And whoops, here I am lying again. I'm still covering up, covering up, covering up. I steal something. You see, whatever it is that you step out of God's will, because you've been to, you begin to cover up. And so he covers up. He summons Uriah to come from battle back so he'll sleep with his wife. And that way he'll think nine months later that the kid is his. But Uriah is devoted to the king. He's devoted. He, he's a patriot. He's devoted to Israel. And he says, how could, how could I go home to my wife? I'm going to sleep in the palace to guard the king. That's what it's all about. So he doesn't go home. 
Now nah, David's all upset. He says, hey, I want, you, I want you to come and have dinner with me tonight. And, and he gives them not grape juice, but man, he's giving them the really high alcohol content wine because he gets them drunk. Hoping to send him home. You know, he says, hey, psst, this is the way you go. But he makes his way back and he's there guarding the palace with the other, uh, uh, other soldiers because how, how could I go home and enjoy my wife while all my fellow soldiers are in battle uh, on the battle line front? Uh, I'm going to be here to protect the king. And so the next day when he comes in, he writes a letter to General Joab and he says, hey, put Uriah in the fiercest fighting of the battle so that he dies. He says, don't worry, you know, the enemy kills one, they kill another, people are going to die. So, seals it, gives it to Uriah, and Uriah goes off, cover it up. He hands his own death sentence to Joab the general. Joab the general puts him in the fiercest part of the battle, he's killed. He's killed in battle. And so then, Joab sends a letter back basically say, it's done, he's done. David, and all this cover-up, he's done really good. Nobody knows, just Joab knows that he killed this guy. He takes Bathsheba to be his wife, but he's lost his joy. You know how much he's lost his joy? Psalm 32, he tells us how much joy he's lost. When I kept silent, I didn't say, I was hiding this whole thing. My bones wasted through my groaning all day long. My bones. I, I could feel it in my body. You, 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 you've experienced that. When you've been covering something up, you know you're wrong, and, and it just, it's just tearing you up physically. Physically, there's a connection between your emotion, your soul, and your body, and, and it's, they call it psychosomatic. Your, your soul, your psyche is influencing your body, so you're run down, you're weak, you get sick, lady. said, that's where I'm at. For day and night your hand is heavy upon me. I love the expression. It's one of my favorite expressions in the Bible. The good hand of the Lord was upon me. <laughs> this time the good hand of the Lord is the heavy hand of the Lord, and it is just squishing him down into the dirt. You know what that's like. You're so convicted, you're guilty, you have no joy, you feel like everything's going wrong, and you know in your mind because of what you've done, your conscience is pricked, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, and that's all going on. And he says, I'm just being pressed down into the ground. He's lost his joy. <laughs> you see what's going on here? Anyways. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Remember on the hot, hot summer day you've been out all day? You go in and you're just exhausted. Why? Just from the heat. You're exhausted. You turn that air conditioner on high and you're blowing it right in your face, man. You, you, you're just totally drained. He said, that's the way I am because I've lost my joy. I want to suggest to you that when we as Christians lose our joy, it's because we step out of the will of God Maybe we're not adulterers like he was. Maybe I'm just a simple liar. Maybe I'm just a simple cheat. I just fudge the numbers on my taxes or something. Or, you know, but you know inside, and you're the one that you're feeling exactly like he's feeling. Your joy is gone. So now I want to turn and talk about God's joy is restorable. <laughs> Advent joy, that joy you have the moment you get saved, that same joy can come to you today. God's joy is restorable. Okay, so he had joy, he was tempted, he yielded, he covered it up, he lost his joy. And here's how it comes back. His, his, his being out of God's will is exposed. And it's exposed by the preacher. <laughs> it's a funny way it is that preachers... They're good guys and bad guys. Good guys when they say things that make you feel good, and they're the bad guys when they say the things that make you feel bad. The preacher's name is Nathan. He's a prophet. He's charged to go before the king. Listen, the Bible is political all the way through. This is politics. 
Nathan, the preacher, has to go before, like the president, he's the king of Israel, and he's got to call him out for being wrong. Now, because he's a king, he can do to Nathan just like he did to Uriah. He can have his head. He can have his head if he doesn't like what he says. So, king, the king there is, is on his throne, and, and Nathan goes in, and, and he goes in, and he's very tactful. He knows that David was a shepherd, and he loved sheep. He was a shepherd boy. So he goes in, and he says, hey, I want to tell you what's going on here. There was a man, he, he had lots of wealth, and he had plenty of flocks and herds, and, and his neighbor, he only had one little lamb, and he loved that lamb, he raised it from, you know, from birth, and, and, and it was like a pet to him. In fact, it was like a daughter to him. He didn't even slept in bed with him. This, this was his lamb, his prized possession. And the neighbor who had everything came and he stole his lamb because a friend came to town and he, he sacrificed his lamb for a meal for his friend. And, and David gets all angry and upset because he stole the man's only little lamb and he gets angry. He says, that man deserves to die. He's exposed. He's convicted. That man deserves to die. And then Nathan says, you are the man. I gave you all of Israel. Anything you want, I would have given you but you stole Uriah the Hittite's wife to take as your own, and you killed her husband with the sword of the Ammonites. You are the man. If I'd have been Nathan, I'd have been shaking in my boots when I said that. <laughs> you are the man. Why? He could have easily said, enough of that. Boom, you're dead. But he's convicted, and he confesses. This is so great. Back in Psalm 32, after he talked about how terrible it was, it says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. He said, I quit covering up. I just laid it out there. I sinned. I lusted. I yielded. I took, I'm an adulterer. And he just laid it all out there before the Lord. He just confessed my iniquity. He says, and I will confess my transgressions. He said, I've turned the corner here. I, I'm no longer high. Now I'm confessing everything I did wrong. I confessed it to the Lord. This is the path and the journey to get back your joy when you've lost it. I got to get back into the will of God. Yes, I cheated on my tax. I might have to make an amended, amended tax reform, uh, ta tax form. Uh, I, I've lied to somebody. I go up to that person and tell them the truth. He confesses his transgressions to the Lord, and here it comes. The joy is restored. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. <laughs> Micah says, who is a pardoning God like ours? All you have to do is confess your sin and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And when you're cleaned, oh my goodness. You know the experience when you've been out working in the yard all day and you're hot and you're sweaty and you're all dirty all over. Maybe you've been you know, doing shrubs and, and it's all getting on you and you're just sweaty and it's stuck, it's all over you. And you go in the house and you take a shower and you feel so clean. It feels so good. All his sins were washed away and, and, and David felt so good. The joy was back. The joy was back. That's how it is for us. See, that's what Advent joy is really about. Humanity was lost in its sin and God sent a Savior 
on first advent, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and bore all that shame, all that sin, all that dirt, all that muck. He took it all on himself and he paid the price of our debt to cleanse us and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And that's why the angel says, I bring you good news. Here's the good news. Great joy. Joy can be restored to humanity. And it's there for all people. It's there for the taking. You see, what you need to do today is take the good news, that is the, the eight-note scale, with its pauses in there, you need to take it with you. And what am I talking about? Joy to the world. The Lord has come. He's our joy. If you don't have it, I just showed how to get back to it. You just confess to the Lord, Lord, I messed up. What is it you need me to do? Because he is the Savior. He is the life ring. You take the life ring. He pulls you in, and you will rejoice. You will rejoice. Now, to me, that's Advent joy. That's Advent joy. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, someone here has lost their joy. And right now, while we're praying, they just need to confess what it is. They know in their heart what it is that's the blockage that's got them outside of your will doing their own thing. And if they just name it, they lay it before you, turn from it, you will restore their joy. For joy is here for all people. They are not exempted. It's here for them. Lord, those of us here who have the joy today, we need to just spread that joy. Help us open up our mouths with a cheerful word, positive thing to say that people inquire more about our lives of joy that we can point them to Jesus, the joy of the world. Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.